Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here or have been here already and you enjoy what you are listening to, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button and hit the bell icon to all. That way you don't miss out on every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Home Alone and Break-In Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. Right before the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes only. First of all, I'm French, so forgive me if I make any mistakes. Second of all, my story is probably going to be long, but I think it's worth it. Anyway, let's get into my story. It all started two years ago. I dropped out of school. I was at home every day, suffering with depression and social anxiety. And since both of my parents work, I was alone in my house a lot of the time. So, one day, I was alone, just chilling, watching Netflix, and eating some snacks in my room. Then, I heard the interphone ringing. I never answer the interphone when I'm home alone because of my anxiety, so I just ignored it, even if the person was really persistent. Then, a few seconds later, I heard noises in the hall of my residence. I live in the ground floor, so when people make noise, I hear it. I assume it was the neighbors. Maybe a few seconds later, I heard someone ringing and knocking on my door brutally. With my anxiety issues, I started to feel anxious and I grabbed a knife, just in case this person was trying to break into my house. Then, silence. But when I thought it was over, one or two minutes later, I heard someone who was literally beating my kitchen window so hard that my window ended up opening. At this point, I was hiding in the hallway with my knife, so I got to see the man's face when he opened the window and looked into the kitchen to see if anybody was here. I was terrified. I didn't know what to do, but when I discreetly looked at the man's face, it was really disturbing. He had a really chill, cold, relaxed look about him. He looked into the kitchen one last time and left. I knew there was something wrong with this guy, but I was so scared that I called my aunt to come pick me up because I really didn't want to spend more time at home after that just happened. So I was waiting, still holding my knife, anxious as fuck, until she came. Days after the incident, I never saw the guy again. So... That was two years ago, but yesterday, my dad told me something he's never told me before, because he didn't want me to become even more anxious. Two sisters of my neighborhood saw a guy hanging around my house for a few days, especially around my bedroom window. My window was just in front of the resident parking lot, and the guy was hiding behind cars and stalking me through my window and I had no clue that that was happening. One day, one of the sisters took a photo of the guy, so he knew he was discovered. The girl who took the photo told my dad about all of this, and my dad was watching if the guy was still around our residence, but he never saw him, and since then, nobody saw this guy. My opinion is the guy's first move was to knocking and ringing at my door to see if there was anyone here. I don't know if he figured that I was here or not. I think his second move was to stalk me and hung around my window. But when one of the sisters took a photo of him, he knew he was screwed. That's why when my dad was watching if the guy was still around, he didn't show up. He knew he was completely screwed. A question still haunting me though. What would have happened if nobody saw him. If no one took a picture of him, and, most importantly, what were his true intentions? Was I a target for this guy? 
Too many questions, but not many answers. Anyway, to the creepy guy who was stalking me, I hope we'd never meet again. All right, everyone, buckle up. This is going to be a long one. This happened almost two months ago to this day. I think it's worth mentioning that while this story takes place in a Southeast Asian city with a population of a little over 1. million, I didn't always live there. I was born and raised in a small town in the Midwestern United States. You know, the kind where everyone knows everyone and we only gain attention during an election year. Anyway, my parents and I made the big move in 2014 due to a number of reasons. The biggest one being so my mother could be with her family, since this is her homeland. However, the town where all of the relatives live is about an eight-hour drive away. We had to move to our city because it's the safest in the region for foreigners, and my dad is a pretty obvious white man. Now, unlike every other college student in the world, I hadn't done much this summer. The heat was blistering all hours of the day, and I didn't have money to spend, even if I was willing to leave our air-conditioned apartment. The only thing enticing me to the outdoors were the incessant sounds of construction due to a new unit being added to our complex. However, leaving was obviously inevitable, so toward the end of the month, my parents and I went to buy groceries. The next day, My mom and I went to buy some things we had initially forgotten, and the day after that, the two of us went out again to pay some bills. That made three consecutive days of going out for the first time in literally a month. To say I was exhausted was an understatement. By 7 p.m. on the third night, I was already fast asleep on the living room couch. My mom woke me up at around 10 that same night, and told me to head up to my room. I was too tired to do my entire night routine, so I quickly brushed my teeth and went upstairs. I noticed that my cat was already asleep in my bed, which happens once in a blue moon, since he's basically my mom's shadow. So I got into bed while contorting myself at an angle that wouldn't disturb him. Cat lovers, you know what I'm talking about. I turned on a dim light, plugged in my phone, and started playing a random YouTube video, then eventually falling asleep. I didn't know what time it was, but I awoke up to the feeling of my bed shaking. I tend to ignore movements like this because they happen often when my cat sleeps with me, as he has a habit of scratching his ear, but there was a pretty strong earthquake just the other night, so I assumed it was another one making me open my eyes and look down at my cat to see which of the two it was. Indeed, he was scratching his ear. Oh, and there was my mom at the foot of my bed. Nothing out of the ordinary. She was probably checking on me before her and my dad went out for their 5 a.m. walk as routine and was bending down to pet the cat. I closed my eyes and was just about to slip back into slumber when my half-asleep brain realized that a number of other things were indeed out of the ordinary. With eyes that were barely open, I looked at my mom with blurred vision. The first thing I noticed was that she was wearing one of my high school t-shirts. My mom and I are far from the same size, and she doesn't have a history of borrowing my clothes. Weird, but not unsettling. Maybe she ran out of, I don't know, clean exercise shirts and decided to use one of my own. I then noticed that she was also wearing another one of my high school t-shirts, but this one was wrapped around her head in a weird way that outlined the shape of it, not covering anything, but just framing her profile. In my peripheral, I noticed that my closet doors were wide open. My mom always nagged me to close them because she said it wasted the cool air coming from the air conditioner. 
so I made sure to keep them closed whenever I wasn't getting ready. Another random realization hit me when my brain finally registered the fact that while my mom does pet my cat when she comes in to check on me, she's never bent down like the person in my room was doing. Looking back now, I don't even think I've seen her bend like that since I was a kid. Keep in mind, all those thoughts flooded my mind in about five seconds. Still, my half-asleep and half-stupid-as-fuck brain was more focused on my mom and why she was wearing my clothes as opposed to all the things that were off in this situation. I sat up a bit and squinted my eyes so I could read the shirt since there was some writing on the back that would help me distinguish if it was actually mine and not just one that looked like mine. That's when the person turned to look right at me before running out of my room, maintaining an ungodly crouching position that will be burned in my mind for the rest of my life. It wasn't until he was near the stairs that I fully processed what was happening. That person was not my mom. They weren't even a female. Instantly, I shot out of bed and instinctively wrapped my blanket around me to cover my nightclothes that suddenly felt so revealing. It was only when I began screaming, I hesitatingly followed him out of my room and watched as he ran down the wooden stairs with deafening steps that echoed throughout the third floor, almost drowning out my piercing cry. If I was going to get my parents' attention, who were sleeping on the other side of closed door on the second floor, I needed to be louder. I stood at the foot of those stairs and pushed my lungs to their limit. I could practically feel the capacity stretch inside my ribcage. After what felt like ages and was probably only another five seconds, my parents' door swung open and my mom ran up the stairs with a panic-stricken expression that I will never forget. She grabbed me by the shoulders and shouted, What? Uh, what, honey? What, what, what's wrong? I turned to look at her with my mouth agape and my brows furrowed in mixture of confusion and disbelief. Had she not seen the man when he ran right past their bedroom door? It all seemed so fast, I wasn't sure if they had crawled paths or not. Someone's in the house, I responded with a voice that I honestly didn't recognize. Without missing a beat, she wrapped her arm around me and ushered me down the stairs. Grab the gun, she shouted in the country's native language. We ran into my parents' bedroom where my dad stood in the doorway with tired eyes and a slumped posture. I pushed him into the room and turned around to close the door, simultaneously fiddling with the light switch so we weren't in complete darkness. My movements were shaky and spastic, causing my fingers to fumble and flicker the lights on and off before eventually being able to to lock the door. <laughs> what, what are you doing? My dad asked with a soft laugh as he switched the light on after my attempts proved too futile. I turned to him with the same incredulous expression I had when looking at my mom. He had been standing in the doorway to his room in perfect view of the man running away, yet he seemed to be oblivious. There's someone in the house. I repeated, watching his face instantly drop at my words. With the door now locked, I turned to my parents and watched them silently waiting for them to say or do something. For 19 years, they had taken care of me and catered to my every want and need. Now, there they stood, just as scared and defenseless as I was. In that moment, they were just people. My dad, an infamous type A personality, kept his focus on the floor, most likely processing the entire situation before deciding what to do next. My mom was the complete opposite. Her cell phone was in one hand while the other hand was running through her hair so many times that I was sure strands were going to end up between her fingers. I can't call 911. It's not working. I took the phone from her and dialed it myself, bringing the phone up to my ear, only to hear a monotone voice say, Sorry, 
but your balance is too low to make this call. In this country, most of the phones were prepaid, so if you don't have any money on your account, you can't make any calls or texts. However, my mom said that she had just added money to her account just a few hours earlier. I tried calling my aunt, who lives eight hours away, and it worked. It was then I figured out that you can only use cell phones to call other cell phones, and you can only use landlines to call other landlines, aka 911. The only problem was that our landline was in the second floor hallway, a few feet from the other side of the door. Once I told my parents what our only options was, my mom opened the window and began shouting for help in her native language. Similar to a knee-jerk reaction, I instantly shut the window. Don't do that. They'll know we're defenseless and they'll come back. At that time this happened, we had been in the room for about 40 minutes. I was convinced that if they had left and then heard her screaming, they would come back since they would know we were just sitting ducks. Are you sure you saw someone? Maybe you were just dreaming, my dad said, this being his first string of words since barricading ourselves. How could he have gotten in? The door has two locks and a heavy pull across it. A little context about the pole. After the lock on our screen door broke, my mom had insisted on putting a metal pole across the door to ensure no one would be able to get in. No, I know what I saw, I answered without hesitation, and my brain starting to dissect the possibility of the figure simply being a figment of my imagination. The sounds and movements he made were so vivid, but the situation as a whole seemed too surreal. There was no way someone could get inside without that pole acting as a shield, and neither of my parents had seen the man. Internally, even I wasn't 100% sure of myself, but on the outside, I stuck to my guns. I saw a man. Okay, then we need to get out of this room and call the police, my dad said restlessly. My overthinking got the best of me as I thought about us leaving the room. Were there more people? Were they waiting for us? Were they right outside the door? Or were they hiding and would spring out when we least expected it? Maybe they were still in our apartment continuing to raid through our things since they knew we were too scared to leave. Had they heard my mom screaming for help and came back? We searched the room for weapons to protect ourselves with, but we wouldn't find anything even remotely useful. What happened to the gun my mom was shouting for earlier, you ask? It never existed. She just said that so the man would hopefully leave out of fear. So, with half a pair of broken scissors in my dad's hand and a small floor fan in my mom's hand, we prepared ourselves for whatever was on the other side of that door. My dad unlocked the door and swung it open swiftly, hoping to catch anyone out there off guard. The complete silence mixed with the eerie yellow lighting coming from our hallway seemed like a scene out of a horror movie. Straight ahead, we all noticed that the door to the second floor balcony was wide open and the screen on the window next to it had been pried open. The first feeling to run through me was assurance. Assurance of knowing that I wasn't crazy and that I hadn't made this up. The second feeling to run through me was pure dread. Knowing that I wasn't crazy and I, unfortunately, hadn't made this up. We searched the second floor and found no one and nothing that seemed out of the ordinary. We then moved on to the first floor and found our pitcher of water dripping condensation on the kitchen table. My mom asked me if I had forgotten to put it back before I went to bed, but I distinctly remember only brushing my teeth. I knew I hadn't gotten it out. Our windows have the glass on the outside and the screen on the inside, contradictory to typical American windows, 
and we saw that the glass windows were wide open and the screen had been pried with. However, both of the locks on the door were bolted and the pole was still in place. We figured that the man had initially attempted to come in by putting his hand through the small gap he made in the screen window, trying to reach for the door so he could unlock it. However, I guess his calculations were off and he couldn't make the distance. That's when he climbed up to the second floor, probably by scaling the apartment that the construction workers had yet to finish, and did the same procedure to the balcony window. He was successful this time because the distance is much shorter. We called 911 a total of five times and it took them 45 minutes to get to our apartment, despite the fact that the police station is a three minute drive away. While waiting, my mom knocked on other apartments to let them know what was going on. Now, our complex consists of four apartments, but I'd say it looks more like a paired home with four different sections. The first one is rented out to an online business company. The second is rented out to a family who had just moved in that exact night. We were the third ones, and the fourth one had no tenants. Neither of them answered, probably because who would answer the door at 2.30 in the morning? The police eventually came and told us that someone had made a call earlier, saying that they heard a woman screaming for help. Yep, that was my mom. But they couldn't find the location of the screens. They searched the house but found no one and didn't even tell us how to file a report. Yeah, they were pretty useless. The next day, my mom talked to the people at the first apartment, and they were obviously shaken up. They told her that they had heard her knocking, but it's company policy to not open the door from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. My mom had moved on to apartment two and told them what had happened. The man and his pregnant wife said that they didn't hear anything, despite going to bed at 2 a.m. and having their windows opened. I was somewhat skeptical because my scream was pretty loud, even giving my mom nightmares days after the incident, and all of our windows and second story door were open. There's another building just a few feet away so sound resonates pretty loudly, making the construction booming even behind closed doors, and my mother's screams that were loud enough for someone to call the police? I was highly doubtful they didn't hear anything. With the first apartment, it made sense because they only used the first floor and all the windows were closed due to the air conditioning being on. My mom told the couple to be wary of the construction workers because she believed that they decided to rob us after seeing that my dad was a foreigner, automatically assuming that we were rich or something. The man's face instantly dropped and his tone turned cold. My mom asked him for the landlord's number, since the old number didn't work anymore, and he said he would give it to her after he visited her today, since he didn't have it on him. It took him four days to finally give us the number, and he did so with what seemed like a sincere apology, saying sorry for taking so long and for what happened to us. That same day, we called the landlord and she seemed shocked, telling us that nothing like that has ever happened in any of her apartments before. However, my mom had talked to a tenant in the apartment behind us, it was owned by the same landlord, and she said that she knows of at least three people in her complex who have had their place broken into. Later, the maintenance man came to inspect our window and we found out that the construction workers were hired because they're all members of our landlord's church, and the man who just moved in with his wife is the bishop at their church. Before my mom could even bring up her theory, the maintenance man told her that he was convinced it was a construction worker. We kept realizing that things were missing over the course of two weeks, like my backpack, some sunglasses, money, jewelry, some stuff out of our storage room, etc. My phone was also taken. I assumed that when he was crouching over my bed, he was trying to reach for both 
the phone and the charger since I was probably laying on the wire or something. My laptop and a camera were both sitting on my desk next to my jewelry box, but he didn't take those. My parents assumed it's because he was going to take the heavier items when he was about to leave so he wouldn't have to carry them around. However, I didn't see anything in his hands when he was running away from me, which makes me think that he either left the other items by the door for easy exit or there was someone else in the house helping him. A few weird things. He took four of my t-shirts, two of them being exactly the same. He also went into my cousin's room and stole her towel. Thankfully, she had gone home for the summer, so she wasn't around, but it almost seemed as if the thief knew that. He went into her room, and my room, but completely avoided my parents' room. I also couldn't get over the fact that he drank our water straight from the jug, which would have made sense since he climbed to the second story. However, this country is notorious for being superstitious, and my mom said that thieves tend to leave water out because it makes the homeowners go into a deep sleep. Something about the water resembling the calming waves of an ocean or something. I've never been one to believe in superstition, and she thinks that's why I was able to wake up. Just a few hours after the incident, we decided that we were going to move back to the state. This wasn't the only occurrence affecting our decision, but it was the straw that broke the camel's back. I'm just thankful that we all came out safe and nothing worse happened. I'm also incredibly grateful for my cat, since he's basically the hero for waking me up. In fact, my cousins are fighting over who will get to keep him once we leave. Oh, and a quick edit. Some people are doubting the authenticity of the story because you can still call 911 on a prepaid phone even if it's out of minutes. In the Philippines, they charge you five pesos anytime you call 911. Hello everyone, the story I'm about to tell you happened three days ago and I have never been this scared in my entire life. I'm a French student doing a master's in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. I live alone in an apartment in a building where there are only students. I'm 22, enjoying life peacefully. To give you a bit of context, I live in a calm, good neighborhood. The only noises I'd hear are the tram or parties in the building, since a lot of students are there. One night, at around 10 p.m., I hear a knock on my door. I live on the third floor, and to get to my front door, you have to open the main door, which needs a key. Then, you need to open the door to my corridor with the same key. So, people who want to come to my door must have the key. Call me or ring at the door so I could open the doors for them from my apartment. Nothing of this happened. I just hear a knock on my door. I usually open the door without a second thought, whether it's my landlord or a neighbor asking for something. As I told you, I feel pretty safe in the building, and I could also take care and defend myself in case anything happened. But this time, for some reason, I had a bad feeling about this. I didn't move at first. I thought the person must have just left. I'd finished my assignment. However, the knocking continued for 30 seconds. I yelled, yeah? The person knocking doesn't say anything. I say in English again, who is it? The voice answers in English, it's Uber Eats which is weird because Dutch always speak in Dutch and I recognize the voices and accents of everyone on my floor who have the key to access the floor. So it wasn't a neighbor. It wasn't my landlord. It was somebody claiming to come from Uber Eats. But the issue is I didn't order anything from Uber Eats that day. The voice was unfamiliar. 
in case it's a prank or a neighbor pulling a joke. It was just a deep voice, at least 40, and probably a smoker. I replied that, uh, I didn't order anything. You must have it wrong. After a few seconds, the knocking continues, and the same voice says, I'm pretty sure you did. I have an order under your name. I started panicking. I looked around and picked up a knife in case he breaks the door, because the knocking was getting a bit louder. I checked if my door is locked. It wasn't. I was literally 10 centimeters away from him. My front door was the only thing keeping him from me, and I'm glad it doesn't open from the outside. You need a key to open it, even if it's not locked. I step back and I ask again, Uh, what's the name? He seems to be thinking for a few seconds. Then, a final knock occurs. It was loud, and it translated some anger or frustration. Finally, I hear him going down the emergency stairs right next to my apartment. The steps are heavy, and the person was clearly in a hurry. I don't know what he wanted or what would have happened to me if I had opened that door, as I usually do. I still haven't understood how he got through the two doors and why he came specifically to the last apartment on the third floor. Did he try others before? I posted a post about it on WhatsApp. We have a group in the building. No one saw anything suspicious. No one opened the door for anyone. Anyway, I'm lucky for my instinct telling me not to open that door, and I'm so glad I listened. It was 1990, and I was 13 years old. It was a Friday night, and my parents went out for the evening. They were visiting an aunt's house, which was about 45 minutes away. My best friend was staying the night, and we were upstairs chilling in my room. Now, the bedroom I was in had previously been my sister's just a few weeks prior. She moved in with a friend, so I jumped on the chance to get the big room. It was on the second floor with two windows, one on the front of the house and another on the side, right next to the chimney. My back was to the side window when she screamed a horrible scream. I turn and look and she's yelling that there was a man in the window. She saw his face and he had his hand on the windowsill. I questioned what she saw because, hello, we're on the second floor. About 10 seconds later, my dog starts going off downstairs. Our house was positioned weird. We were right around a bend in the road on a very steep hill with a thick forest about 20 feet from the back of the house. There was a large deck that ran the stretch of the house with a door to the kitchen on one and a set of French doors going into the family room on the other. We got a lot of animals on the deck, so I tried to write his barking off on a possum. No dice. He is running back and forth across the back of the house, chasing something. It's pitch black, and I am not going downstairs to turn the light outside on. Then, it didn't matter. The dog was at the front door, freaking out. So I did the stupidest thing you can imagine. I went for my dad's gun that he kept in his sock drawer. It wasn't there. I was afraid to call the police because it was a false alarm. My dad would have literally beat the shit out of me. So I called my neighbor. He was an FBI agent, and for some reason I thought that made him cop-like. I told him the brief rundown and that we were home alone. A span of about five minutes had passed, and I finally realized I needed to call my parents. No one answered, so we made arrangements for my friend's mom to get us so I could stay over there. I was not staying in the house alone. A few minutes later, my neighbor knocks on the door. He said that he was walking into the yard. A car pulled out right 
around the bend. There was no street parking, so whoever it was didn't live nearby. There was also a parking lot across from where they were. He said he would talk to my parents when they got home and would look around the yard the next day. Finally, my friend's mom arrived about 20 minutes later. I left a note, loved my dog, locked up, and took off. The next day, my dad was pissed. He said my friend made it up for attention and that I blew it out of proportion. He was such a nice guy. The neighbor came back over and looked around. He mentioned some holes that were under the window next to the chimney. Finally, my dad starts taking it seriously. He immediately starts inventorying belongings, and we start inspecting the house thoroughly. I found pry marks on the front door. We seldom use it, so we wouldn't have noticed right away. But little else. Now, I didn't tell him about the gun because I assumed he moved it, and if he knew I went looking for it, he would beat my ass. Well, he didn't know it was missing and flipped his lid, understanding. He then went through his important paperwork and discovered that several credit cards were missing, as well as some collectibles that were stashed in his closet. We inventoried our belongings. My mom was missing some jewelry, and I was missing ugh, all of my Z Cavaricci clothes, as well as some knickknacks. Cops were called and a report was filed. It took a few days, but he was able to get info on charges made on one of the cards. It took over a week to get all the statements. There was charges for jewelry, clothing, alcohol, and the one that stood out, lots of baby supplies, including a crib. All the clues led to one person, an old friend of my sister's that she had had recently started hanging out with again. She was pregnant. There's a family meeting and my sister says that she lent her car to the girl a few times while she was at work. Our dad had her call the girl and tell her that if she confessed to what she did, he wouldn't press charges against her. She admits to copying the house and car key when she borrowed the car. While everyone was gone, her and some friends came in and took things. She didn't know about the gun or that something happened that one night. It seems her friends were coming back without her. I'm trying to remember if she got in trouble or not, but I know a few of her friends got arrested. They changed the locks, added a keypad on the garage, and my dad started setting booby traps. The worst trap was a series of razor blades that he duct taped around the doorknobs. That one almost caught me sneaking in one night. All right, I am a girl and this happened when I was 20 in the early 2000s. People used landlines and cell phones were not unlimited. This happened in a town about an hour away from Sacramento. My friend was house-sitting for a family that her family was friends with from church. She was to house-sit in the country just outside of town for a week. They had animals like cats, rabbits, a donkey, and a horse. The family also had dogs too, but the family took the dogs with them. My friend was in charge of feeding the animals and watching the place. She didn't have to get the mail daily because they had this metal lockbox style mailbox down their long driveway. They didn't have any neighbors for miles, just fields of cattle and corn, so I guess the lockbox was for safety? Towards the end of the week, she asked if I wanted to spend the night and keep her company, and I thought it sounded fun. I had moved out of my aunt's and uncle's and gotten my own apartment, so I told her I'd pick her up on the way there after I got out of work. We got there at around 9.30 p.m., grabbing dinner on the way. We went into the barn first thing and fed the animals. 
It was late for their dinner, and they made their hunger known with their animal noises. We made sure they had water, then went inside. The house was this big, ranch-style house, single story. The living room was to the left as you walked into the home. There was a long hallway directly to the right of the entrance that led to where the bathroom and bedrooms were. Straight ahead was a dining area, and to the left of that was the kitchen area and a patio door. They did not have an open floor plan. In the kitchen, on the opposite side of the dining area, was a long hall that had several doors. My friend explained that the wife ran a daycare center out of her home. These rooms were play areas for the kids she took care of. We didn't bother going over there because we had no interest. We watched some TV, ate our leftovers, and talked about people we knew. As it got later, she turned on the house alarm and said she didn't like sleeping in other people's beds, so she had been sleeping on the couch, then offered it to me. She would sleep on one of the two huge recliners and reclined so far back it was almost flat. The chairs were really comfortable, so I just said I'd take the chair. I went and laid back in a chair with my blanket. We turned off the TV and were talking for maybe 20 minutes in the dark when the motion sensor floodlight started shining through the window, lighting up the room. Now, I really have no idea why people in the country think it's okay not to have curtains or blinds, because to me that's insane. We both got quiet and Amanda said, Maybe it's one of the cats? Then we start hearing gravel crunch, like a person walking across the gravel in the parking area outside. The chair was closest to the window, and I slid carefully down to the floor, clutching the stupid blanket the whole time. The floodlight timed out, and my friend slid to the floor too. We laid on our stomachs in the dark, not knowing what to do for a minute, when we heard a loud bang, and all of a sudden, the house alarm started blaring, and the floodlight turned on again. It was so loud, we covered our ears, and I started to panic. I swear I have never been so close to pissing myself in all my life. I began crawling towards the keypad for the security, because I've seen the commercials. There's a button you push, and a person responds to you in case of an emergency, or at least sends the police. The main screen says, Patio 1 or 2 open. Amanda starts to cry a little and hits the call assistance button on the pad and nothing happens. There's no assistance. I ask her where the phone is and she says there's a phone in the kitchen and one in the parents room down the hall. So our choices are to go to the kitchen past the windows and next to one of the patio doors or to go down the hall to the parents room and use the phone there. I asked her where the other patio is, and she said it was in the daycare part of the house. It was an easy decision. We go inside the parents room, and it is pitch black. I ask her where the phone is, and she says, I think we have to turn on a light. I really did not want to turn a light on, but we had no choice. I don't have a flashlight, and I didn't bring my cell phone. I had limited minutes. It was a simpler time, and Amanda didn't even get her own cell phone until after this had happened. She turned on the lights, and we start looking around the room. Not only did these people not have curtains on any window, but they didn't even have closet doors. We see a golf club leaning against the wall by the bed. They probably have it instead of a baseball bat, which is what I had next to my bed at home. We figured if we hit someone with it, it's gonna leave a mark. She grabs it and we continue our search for the phone. Looking at the obvious places, we find a cordless phone stand, minus the actual phone. The alarm is still raging. We have a light on, and the person who opened the patio door is bound to notice. 
is all I'm thinking about at this point. She asks, should we use the locate phone button? I looked at her and responded, yeah, if you want some strange guy coming in here with it and asking us if we were looking for something, I'm getting pissed that I'm scared and in this situation. Standing there knowing we have to go to the kitchen, the house alarm stops. It gets country quiet. If you've ever lived in the country, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There isn't another golf club for me to grab, so I make her go out first, flipping every light on and keeping the doors we passed in the hallway closed. We double check the security panel and it still says patio open. Hit call button and it still doesn't work. Double checking the front door is locked. We start for the kitchen. I tell her we have to check the patio near the kitchen and I grab a big knife that wasn't even close to being sharp from the kitchen. We check the patio door near the kitchen and it's locked. We turn on all the lights and grab the phone and dial 911. The phone isn't a cordless phone. It's one of the old ones with the cord attached on a wall. My friend is on the phone with a dispatcher telling her what happened and I hear a whistle coming from outside the kitchen window. The thing people don't think about, because I didn't in my thinking that safety was turning on the light, is while you have the reflection of the inside on the window, people on the outside have a clear view of you, unless you press your face against the window. I hear the whistle again. It sounds like someone trying to get someone else's attention, kind of whistle. But I don't see anything outside, and I'm not pressing my face to the window to see if I'm the person they're whistling for. My friend is still talking to the dispatcher and is crying and saying she doesn't have the address to the house. She hands me the phone, and I say, Hello? The dispatcher lady, who sounds annoyed, tells me she needs an address to send the police to. I ask that she trace the call and she says something like, you're house sitting and you don't even know where you're at? Scared, angry, and overwhelmed, I hand the phone back to Amanda and start looking for something with an address in the kitchen. I'm looking in the junk drawer, on the counter, on the refrigerator, fully keeping an eye on that hallway that has the daycare rooms knowing that on the other side of one of those doors is a patio door that was opened. Amanda tells the lady that she didn't pick up the mail because of their lockbox, and then a few seconds later removes the phone from her ear and stares at me with a blank face. I ask her if they're tracing the call because I cannot find anything with an address. Amanda tells me, she said, I hope the police find you in time and hung up the phone. This isn't in the story, but uh-uh. I would have called and got her supervisor and got her ass fired. All right, back to the story. I was now really scared and angry at the same time. We knew that there were people outside. We knew that the patio door to the daycare was opened. We did not know what to do. We stood in the kitchen silent for what seemed like forever, but was probably a minute or two. I picked up the phone and dialed 411. I told Amanda that they would have the number to the police department. As calmly as I could, I explained what was happening to us to 411. I included the 911 dispatcher and said we really needed the phone number of the town's police department when we heard a huge metal bang outside the kitchen window by the patio door. It seemed like someone dropped something metal and heavy. Amanda started crying and I couldn't hold in my fear anymore and started crying too. The 411 operator said that they were connecting us and would stay on the line with us after getting pissed at the 911 dispatcher on our behalf. The police officer answered the phone, and the 411 operator started explaining what had happened to the police. They were asked to disconnect once we had an established connection. 
The police ask a few questions, and we heard the whistle again outside, and the floodlights all around the house turned on again. I was too scared to look outside, and we had never turned on the patio light because we had to walk past the patio window to get to the switch. We told the policeman on the phone about the whistle, and he said that there should be several policemen showing up shortly and to stay on the phone. We were just outside the town limits and knew it might take a few minutes. Having an officer on the phone made me feel a little bit better, but I was still really scared. He told us that the police arrived and were coming up the driveway. The police said to put down the phone and open the door, so we did. When I saw a police pickup truck with spotlights flashing into the pastures that ran along the side of the drive, two officers, not with handguns, but with shotguns walking slowly beside the truck as it came up the long driveway. Four officers approached the house asking us our names. One went to the phone and said they were here and hung up the phone. They ordered us to stay in the dining room and begin searching the house and property. One by one they returned. The last one came back in through the patio door by the kitchen. He said he searched the barn and the horse scared him and the horse also looked spooked. He asked what other animals were in the barn. They told us they didn't find anyone and that the daycare patio was not locked. There was, however, a broom handle in the track to prevent it from being open too far. I looked at the patio door that the officer entered in and saw that there was no broom handle in that one, then felt dumb because he just walked through it. They lectured Amanda about not knowing the address of the house she was supposed to be responsible for and other stuff I seriously don't remember. After finishing statements, they said they'd stick around and look more, and if we wanted to leave, we could. We could lock the bottom lock, but not activate the alarm. And we were cool with that. We were out of there so fast. We got into my car and went to her mom's. So mentally exhausted, we fell asleep and I went to my office job the next morning. She said she really didn't want to go back to the house, but she had to feed the animals their breakfast. Her mom told her to take her sister and she did. That afternoon, she called me at work. She was really nervous and began telling me that when they went into the house, there were footprints and poop on the carpet. I said it was probably the cop that tracked that in from the barn. She said that she didn't know or pay attention. Also, she said that when they went into the barn to feed and water the animals in the morning, someone had tied all the rabbits' legs together in their hutches. They had 10 rabbits the kids used for 4-H. Amanda then continues to say there was a note with the word lucky scribbled on the back of a pizza coupon. She thought came from the refrigerator door because the flyer was missing a coupon. It took a while for them to untie the rabbits and Amanda asked her mom to find someone else from their church to finish the house fitting. She was not going back. She also asked the officer what she came back to but no one was ever caught and the police never called either of us to update us about the situation. We still don't know what happened, but Amanda and I both agree we will never ever be house-sitting for that home again. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Home Alone and break-in stories. I'd like to take a moment and give a very special shout-out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Nate Davies, Dola Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Tammy Slayton, Colt Stonewall, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland.